everyone. So this video is about our last minute preparation batch and it's a demo class kind of. So let us start without wasting much of time. Okay. So this is our last minute preparation batch. Yeah. For February 2022. This is basically conducted by me and Dr. Aftab, and this is to prepare you well for the part, um, this part one exam, FOP and TAS exam that is going to be held in the uh, in February 16th to make you more confident. Okay, so what are we going to do here? Is that what are we covering in this course? First is that we are going to cover about 25 to 30 important topics of FOP and TAS in detail. Each FOP and TAS in detail to cover all the frequently asked questions, as well as we're going to give overview of the clinical cases and we're going to do one recall paper. Now, when I say 25 to 30 important topics we are going to be studying, I want to show you one or two topics, how it has to be studied, not in the way that uh, just you know read the topic and it's done. We are not going to be studying in this way. So I have chosen the topic diuretics, I have chosen the topic diuretic and uh, we are going to study in a way that after studying this, after seeing this slide, you will be able to answer all the recalls that are related to this topic and you will be able to answer everything. And there is a case of diuretics in the clinical cases as well. And I have tried to include everything possible here. So let us begin. Okay, so first, what are the different types of diuretics we have? First one, we have loop diuretics such as frusamide. So where do they act? Loop diuretic, they act on the thick ascending limb of loop of henil. Then we have the thiazide diuretic. Thiazide diuretic, they act on the distal convoluted tubule. Then we have spironolactone, which is a potassium sparing diuretic. It acts on the collecting duct. So these three, this three diuretics and where they act is really important, okay? So that is why we have to remember this. If you see this picture, then you'll be able to, you know, understand that, okay, where, where, to, where does this act? Because questions are frequently being asked from there. So thiazide diuretics act on the distal convoluted tubule, loop diuretic act on the thick ascending limb of loop of henel, spironolactone act on the collecting duct, okay? And in addition to this, there are a few other things that I would like to add. One is osmotic diuretics, for example, mannitol. Mannitol acts on the thin ascending limb of loop of henel. Usually mannitol is not included in the uh, diuretics, but you will find this portion of uh, osmotic diuresis in case of um, yeah, diabetic ketoacidosis, whenever there is cerebral edema, they use mannitol and it causes osmotic diuret diuresis. And then the question in the recall comes as such, what is the mechanism of action of mannitol? So mannitol causes osmotic diuresis. Where does it act? It acts on the thin ascending limb of loop of phenyl. So from this picture, just remember four things. Thiazide act on the distal convoluted tubule. Loop diuretic, that is frusamide, act on the thick, thin, thick ascending limb of loop of phenyl. Spironol act on acts on the collecting duct. Okay. Next one, important question that is asked, often asked in the recall is, what is the pump or what is the transporter on what do they act on the diuretics for example the loop diuretic the loop diuretic acts on the sodium potassium 2 chloride channel so what happens when it acts on that we are going to study about that in a while and the thiazide diuretic acts on the sodium chloride channel and the potassium sparing diuretic that is spironolactone acts on the sodium potassium hydrogen channel so this is thing you have to remember and the carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, this is not much important, but it is important in case of idiopathic intracranial hypertension, they'll ask you carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, where does it act? It acts on the proximal convoluted tubule. So you have to remember that loop diuretics act on the sodium potassium 2 chloride channel and it is going to block this channel. So there will be reduced reabsorption of sodium chloride as well as potassium. So there will be more and more diuresis, loss of these electrolytes along with water. Similar way, thiazide will block the sodium chloride channel and there will be reduced reabsorption, no reabsorption of sodium chloride. So there will be diuresis. Sodium will be, sodium and chloride will be excreted from the, via the urine. And we know whenever sodium is excreted, water is excreted along with it. So it causes diuresis. Same for the spironolactone or known as potassium sparing diuretics. 
it acts on the collecting tubule so it's going to block the sodium potassium hydrogen ion channel but it will not lead to excretion of potassium that is why it is known as potassium sparing diuretics therefore it will lead to loss of sodium as well as water so potassium sparing diuretic or known as pyrinolactone is known as aldosterone antagonist because it antagonizes the normal function of aldosterone what is the normal function of aldosterone reabsorption of sodium as well as water and excretion of potassium okay so we have to be very thorough with this along with this one important thing is the anti diuretic hormone the anti diuretic hormone also the questions i have seen in the recall where does the anti diuretic hormone act the anti diuretic hormone acts on the collecting tubule this is the collecting tubule of the kidney and it causes reabsorption of water that's it now let us move yes so this one is the furosemide mechanism of action of furosemide furosemide will block the sodium potassium 2 chloride symport channel in the loop of henle and therefore it will increase the excretion of sodium chloride along with water and therefore increase the urine flow and cause diuresis so it acts as a diuretic now what will be the biochemical picture since it will is going to block the sodium potassium and chloride channel so there will be hyponatremia there will be hypokalemia because it will block the potassium as well hypochloremia along with this there will be metabolic alkalosis <clears throat> so furosemide is going to prolong use of furosemide also causes one syndrome we know so uh, they are going to give you a question like okay a child has come to you and the biochemical picture is hyponatremia hypokalemia hypochloremia with metabolic alkalosis and uh, there has been use of a there is no history there may be a history of use of diuretics and there may be not so you have to think of use of you have to think about furosemide because furosemide excessive use of furosemide leads to this biochemical picture hyponatremia hypokalemia hypochloremia with metabolic alkalosis along with that there will be hypocalcemia so now whenever there is hypocalcemia along with all these features it shows the biochemical picture of barter syndrome so what is barter syndrome barter syndrome it can be caused due to congenital it may be congenital or may be caused due to prolonged use of furosemide in barter syndrome will have a similar biochemical picture okay now let us look at thiazide now thiazide it acts on the distal convoluted tubule and blocks the sodium chloride co-transporter system and therefore there will be excretion of sodium chloride along with water and therefore call therefore cause diuresis now what will be the blood picture there will be hyponatremia hypokalemia hypochloremia metabolic alkalosis this is the biochemical picture after prolonged use of thiazide also prolonged use of thiazide causes one more syndrome known as gitelman syndrome now how will you identify between gitelman syndrome and barter syndrome because in the previous slide itself the the biochemical picture is same hyponatremia hypokalemia hypochloremia with metabolic alkalosis the difference is that in case of use of thiazide or in case of gitelman syndrome one is there will be hypercalcemia in case of gitelman there will be hyperuricemia along with that there will be hypomagnesemia i forgot to write that so hypomagnesemia will only be there in case of gitelman syndrome and in case of barter in case of barter syndrome or prolonged use of furosemide there will be no uh, hypomagnesemia there will be only hypocalcemia so that is going to be the question and they are going to give you a picture and they are going to say a patient has come to you with polyuria polydipsia or say patient has come to you with short stature and delayed or faltering of growth and patient's blood shows hyponatremia hypokalemia hypochloremia metabolic alkalosis along with that hypomagnesemia hypercalcemia hyperuricemia so whenever you see this particular blood picture you have to think of gitelman syndrome and now what are the causes of gitelman syndrome the causes of gitelman syndrome is prolonged use of thiazide so whenever there is prolonged use of thiazide it is going to show this blood picture as well as whenever there is gitelman syndrome it is going to show this blood picture this is how the recalls come now this is another mechanism this is not that important you just need to remember osmotic diuresis how it is done 
what happens is that whenever there is increase in the blood glucose there will be increased glomerular filtration of glucose and there will be increased osmotic pressure because of the presence of glucose in the renal tubular fluid that will lead to decrease in the water reabsorption from the renal tubule and cause osmotic diuresis so osmotic diuresis who causes osmotic diuresis so what is the name of the diuretic that causes osmotic diuresis the name of the diuretic is mannitol where is it used it is used in kind of edema it is used in kind uh, in case of cerebral uh, cerebral edema also it is used in uh, in case of uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension okay because this is an important topic that is frequently asked in the recall as well as there is a clinical case of idiopathic intracranial hypertension and they ask about mannitol okay now there is some other conditions which has similar biochemical picture like we saw here the hyponatremia hypokalemia hypochloremia with metabolic alkalosis with the same biochemical picture there are some other conditions so how are you going to differentiate between these okay so they are also going to present with hyponatremia hypochloremia hypokalemia and metabolic alkalosis i have not included hyponatremia here even though it it also causes this all condition also causes hyponatremia is because in the recall portions mostly they do not mention about the hyponatremia mostly they say a patient has come to you with hypochloremia hypokalemia metabolic alkalosis and they'll give you certain options and you have to differentiate now how are you going to differentiate because all these five things causes this similar picture so use whenever there is pyloric stenosis the blood picture will be hypochloremia hypokalemia metabolic alkalosis so how will you differentiate you are given this particular picture and you are given this five so if it is pyloric stenosis there will be paradoxical aciduria plus the history will be the child has uh, the child has been vomiting there will be history of projectile vomiting and the child is usually less than 8 weeks old so this is how you will differentiate now chloride diarrhea or known as congenital chloride diarrhea it is a congenital chloride losing channelopathy so what happens here is that there will be hypochloremia along with that hypokalemia metabolic alkalosis how you will diagnose how you are going to differentiate from pyloric stenosis is that in pyloric stenosis there is prolonged there is projectile vomiting whereas in chloride diarrhea there will be history of diarrhea and usually it resolves there will be history of diarrhea for about 3 to 4 months and there will be huge loss of chloride the urinary chloride will be very high this is important point they will tell you they give you the picture along with that they'll tell you urinary chloride is very high so whenever urinary chloride is high or excretion of chloride is high and then you have to think about chloride diarrhea it usually resolves after some time now cystic fibrosis cystic fibrosis also known as pseudo barter why known as pseudo barter because the blood picture is same like barter what is barter blood picture same this one hypochloremia hypokalemia metabolic alkalosis now how will you differentiate from these two conditions so if they are saying your child has come to you with hypochloremia hypokalemia metabolic alkalosis and then if it is cystic fibrosis there will be a history of faltering growth there will be history of repeated respiratory tract infection so that is how you are going to differentiate next one is barter syndrome so in case of barter syndrome along with hypochloremia hypokalemia metabolic alkalosis there will be this point there will be hypocalcemia yes so in barter syndrome there will be hypocalcemia and the child will come with polyuria polydipsia there will be faltering of growth or may come in the form of shock because it is very severe and uh, presents during childhood i even saw a question that they told that a child has come to you with polyuria polydipsia with hypochloremia hypokalemia metabolic alkalosis and he had a maternal history there was a history of polyhydraminosis so this is barter syndrome in barter syndrome there is usually a history of polyhydraminosis there is polyuria polydipsia child usually presents with shock and the blood picture is this along with hypocalcemia and use of diuretic so prolonged there will be a prolonged use of diuretic for example the child is having suffer from heart failure or the child was having nephrotic syndrome because of which he was having edema so there will be a history of use of diuretic so they'll give you this blood picture and this blood picture will be same in all these cases but depending on history you will differentiate 
This is usually frequently asked in FOP as well as the TAS exam. Now, there are some other conditions that are similar to this biochemical picture. Just uh, listen to it carefully. I did not say it is same, exactly the same biochemical picture. I said it is similar. With similar, I mean, look at this. In the previous picture, we had hypochloremia, hypokalemia, metabolic alkalosis. Here we have hyponatremia, hypokalemia, and hyperchloremia, plus metabolic acidosis. So it is not the exact similar condition. So actually, they're going to give you a, uh, the recalls where like, if you look through the recalls, you'll find a child has come to you and the biochemical picture given is hyponatremic, hypokalemic, hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. This is caused in case of RTA, renal tubular acidosis. Another condition is uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia or in case of adrenal insufficiency, usually they'll give you a blood picture of hyponatremia and hyperkalemia. So whenever there is hyponatremia along with hyperkalemia and metabolic acidosis, you have to think about adrenal insufficiency or congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Next one, in case of DKA, there will be hyponatremia. That is why we give the fluid. There is hypokalemia. So we give the potassium 20 millimole per 500 ml plus metabolic acidosis that there will be increased blood glucose as well as increased ketones. So what they are going to do in the recalls is that they are going to give you only the blood picture. They will not give you the diagnosis. So you can see the blood pictures are very closely related. But if you, if you look closely, there are certain differences. And if you know the pathophysiology, there are certain differences. In this way, you will be able to differentiate. So they'll give you this blood picture that a child has come to you with hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, metabolic acidosis. Then you have to select adrenal insufficiency. Because in adrenal insufficiency, there is deficiency of aldosterone. So whenever there is aldosterone is not there, there will be hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, and metabolic acidosis. So this is how they present to you. So this was all about my topic, diuretics. And uh, this is one important topic from the part one exam from the last minute preparation batch. And this is how we are going to prepare that this is not only going to include the particular topic, but it is going to include all the recall questions that, that are commonly asked that are, and also include some of some parts of the clinical cases, whatever is important to learn from this topic. And I'm sure if you go through this topic well, from this slide, if you study it, you won't have to look at this topic again. So that's it my about uh, diuretics. Now I will hand over to Dr. Aftab. Thank you, Dr. Fatma. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, guys. I'm Dr. Aftab Ali. Thank you, Dr. Fatma. Mashallah, you explained very well the diuretics. Now it's my turn. So I'm going to discuss uh, CSF circulation today. As Dr. Fatma already said, we are recording this video because that's how we are going to conduct our classes. So let's start with my topic, cerebrospinal fluid circulation. So here are my learning objective today. So first of all, what is CSF? Brief anatomy of ventricles. How CSF is produced? How CSF flow? And how CSF is absorbed from the ventricles? and uh, what are the CSF circulation disorders and last but not the least recall questions. First of all, uh, what is CSF? CSF is a clear fluid that surrounds the brain and spinal cord. Act is cushion and protect brain and spinal cord from injuries and it provide nutrition and remove waste material from the brain. Now the anatomy of ventricle system. There are four ventricles, two are lateral, and uh, one is third ventricle and then fourth ventricle. The ventricles are basically CSF filled cavities in the brain. Okay, this is the lateral ventricle. So, okay, so lateral ventricle have a body, an antrum, and three horns frontal horn, occipital horn, and the temporal horn. So, in, in the lateral ventricular, they, this the red line is choroid plexus from which the CSF is produce. Next is foramen of Monroe, which connect uh, this interventricular foramen, which connects the lateral ventricle to the third ventricle. Then th there is a duct known as the aqueduct of 
cilius or cerebral aqueduct which connects the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle the fourth ventricle is a like triangle or diamond shape from this fourth ventricle foramen of lushka and megandy communicate with the subarachnoid space so csa produced from the choroid plexus of the ventricles mainly the lateral ventricles this red line is the choroid plexus in this this is in the lateral ventricle this is in the third ventricle and there is a fourth ventricle the mainly csa is produced in the lateral ventricle then it flow like this green arrow showing the the flow direction it's flown from the lateral ventricle to the third ventricle uh, via foramen of munro then from the third ventricle to via cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle then from the fourth ventricle uh, it goes into the subarachnoid space via foramen of lushka and foramen of megandy there are two foramen lushka uh, which are lateral and there is one foramen megandy which is central now moving forward with the csf product csf absorption csf absorbs from the arachnoid villi into the dural venous sinuses then into the blood circulation about 80 to 150 ml of csf is produced and absorbs between 3 to 4 times per day so total 500 of csf is produced daily this orders of the csf circulation here we can only discuss the hydrocephalus so what is hydrocephalus a condition in which csf accumulates in the drainage system of the brains enlarging the ventricles which eventually enlarge the brain and cause pressure on brain we can classify hydrocephalus by obstruction to the csf flow decrease absorption by arachnoid villi increase production of csf by choroid plexus now come to the, that picture again so uh, if the problem if the obstruction is at the level of the foramen munro so then the dilatation of the lateral ventricle occur okay now if there is a obstruction at the cerebral aqueduct then the third ventricle dilates if there is a problem obstruction at the level of the lushka and megandy then the fourth ventricle will be dilated so that's how uh, in exams they, the question will be like if there is a obstruction at the foramen lushka and megandy what will happen so you will choose the answer there will be dilatation of the fourth ventricle okay now come to the second point decrease absorption of the csf fluid when there is a infection like meningitis encephalitis or torch infection so in these infections so there will be decrease absorption of the csf if there is arachnoid villi hyperplasia there will be decrease absorption of csf as well now increase production of csf it's mainly due to the csf producing tumors like choroid plexus papilloma okay now moving forward to the one example of uh, aqueduct stenosis so what happen in uh, aqueduct stenosis there is example given by the tumor this tumor is compressing the aqueduct here so it will dilate the third ventricle now i will uh, uh, quickly summarize all this in this picture so in white color you see the brain here it is a brain okay in between the brain there is a corpus callosum this this is the corpus callosum so beneath the corpus callosum there is a lateral ventricle lateral ventricle are of uh, there are two lateral ventricles so one is left and one is right in la lateral ventricle there is a red line it is known as a choroid plexus from this the csf produce then there is a interventricular foramina of munro which is in between the lateral and third ventricle then this is a third ventricle you can see so this is the red line it is a choroid plexus in of the third ventricle so now from the third ventricle there is a duct known as a cerebral aqueduct also known as the duct of sylvius so this duct is drain into the fourth ventricle here is the fourth ventricle so in fourth ventricle you see the red line it is a choroid plexus of fourth ventricle from the fourth ventricle there is a, there are foramina known as a foramen of lushka and megandy so you know all these are uh, communications there will be obstruction like there if there is obstruction uh, the foramen of munro then lateral 
ventricle will be dilated. If there is a problem or obstruction at the level of the cerebral aqueduct, then will be dilatation of the third ventricle. If there is a problem with the or obstruction with the Lushka and Megendi, then the fourth ventricle will be dilated. So they ask questions about uh, uh, these uh, foramina or aqueduct. The CSF fluid from the fourth ventricle then into the this green line, which is subarachnoid space. So it circulate around the brain all day, protect the brain. I briefly describe all about the CSF. Now come to the recall questions, which are commonly asked. And, uh, and as the recalls are recall knowledge of the exam paper, so sometimes it's contain poor knowledge and they are incomplete. So don't be confused. I study these topics from books. If you study well, so uh, these are not the problems. So the first one is the drainage site of CSF, means the absorption site of CSF as we studied is aerognite villi. And number two, the dilatation of the fourth ventricle is due to, we know the, the fourth ventricle drain into the uh, subaerognite space via Lushka and Megendi. So if there is an obstruction at the level of the foramen Lushka and Megendi, so fourth ventricle will be dilated. And the number three, which is the main site of CSF production. So we know it's a choroid plexus. Aerognite villi are the absorption site. So this is just a demo cl demo class of our classes. Good luck guys. So Dr. Fatma kindly end this video with uh, your valuable comments. Thank you Dr. Fatma. Okay. Thank you so much Dr. Aftab. You have explained really well and I'm sure those who have seen this topic from your uh, video, they are going to, they, they don't need to open the book and check because it is all done. It is well explained and you have actually practically included the recalls and everything so it was very well explained thank you so much so that is it this is all about our last minute preparation batch and i have provided all the information here and if you have any other queries you may uh, whatsapp me in this number so this is all about it we'll be covering clinical cases 25 to 30 important topics with this detail when we say we are going to cover 25 to 30 topics we are going to cover it including all the things that are required that for you to crack the exam with this detail. Plus, we are going to cover the clinical cases as well as the recalls. There will be one recall solving class. And moreover, uh, the recordings will be available for each class. It will be a two hour class every day, 10 days long batch, and we'll provide the recordings to all the participants. So that's it about uh, our classes and hope this was useful for you. Thank you.